I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our guest today will be Pulitzer Prize winning science writer and atheist Natalie Anger. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at FFRF.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Our guest today is Natalie Ann Jair, who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1991 and is author of a number of fascinating books, including an amazing book called Woman, an Intimate Geography. It's a celebration of the female body and of biology that was translated into 24 languages. Her book, The Canon, A Whirly Gig Tour of the Beautiful Basics for Science, won the Robert P. Bowles Prize for Critical Thinking. She's edited books on American science writing. Her writings have appeared in The Atlantic and a number of other magazines. And her essays have run in a number of anthologies, including Sisterhood is Forever. Natalie wrote an article, Confessions of a Lonely Atheist, that appeared in the Sunday New York Times Magazine on January 14, 2001, in which she outed herself as an atheist when that was rare. Natalie accepted FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award, reserved for public figures who make known their descent from religion, from the Freedom From Religion Foundation back in 2004. So Natalie, it's almost been 20 years and since we saw you at that awards convention, nice to see you again. Oh, thank you, nice to see you. Yeah, we should talk every 19 years, you know, just to, <laughs> just, just to keep up on things. So you're a science yeah. writer. Mm -hmm. I, I've read, uh, I, I really liked your book, uh, The Canon, which was a great overview of science and what, what people should know about science. But it seems that science writing runs in your family. Um, your husband, Rick Weiss, has covered science for the Washington Post for many years. So, mm -hmm. so what drew you to science and to writing about science? And I should also say that my daughter is now a graduate student uh, in science, so wow. um, we're pushing it forward. What drew me to science is that I guess as a kid, I really just loved the natural world, and I loved going to the Natural History Museum, and I was just fascinated by science, and I was also a good writer, so it was actually my mother who suggested I combine those two and become a science writer. But back when I started out, there was actually very few outlets for that, um, so I was actually on the founding staff of Time Magazine's science magazine called Discover. That was a long time ago. But it just seemed as though the country needed some popular science writing that would get across some of the fascinating discoveries being made every day in science. I still feel that way, although uh, I also have trouble with some of the outcome of what's happened with science, in particular that uh, I feel as though engineering and technology have taken over so that we no longer have as much emphasis on basic science research as we used to. And I think that's a real shame. So we, do, we do want to talk more about science in a bit, but we would love to share with viewers this famous column that you wrote back in 2001 called Confessions of a Lonely Atheist. At that yes. time you wrote, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, God's godlets or any sort of higher power beyond the universe itself, which seems quite high and powerful enough to me. 
So that was a wonderful column. And what prompted you to write that column? And what was the reaction like? Well, at the time, um, this was during the uh, when Bush ran for president as a very openly religious president, and everybody was falling over themselves to who was the most religious. And we even had people like Howard Dean, a physician, when asked, oh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and is going to rise from the dead? And, and Howard Dean, an MD, had to say, yes, I do, because he couldn't have said anything else and gone any further in his political career. And I thought things were getting really out of control, that everybody was talking about religion as this obligatory discipline that you had to enforce. Um, and so I just decided I would talk about my atheism. And so I wrote an article about being an atheist and also about how there are many more of us than you might imagine, and that there was no evidence that being religious made people good or that it solved any problems. And I can tell you the reaction I got to it was fascinating because every single person who wrote to me said, I'm probably going to be the only person writing to you who, who liked your article because they imagined that there was just this, that I was going to get all of this hate mail. And in fact, I got very little hate mail because I tried to present my case rationally and I wasn't excoriating re religion. I was just saying, I'm an atheist and here's why. And people felt like, oh my God, somebody's saying this at last. So it was a huge uh, amount of positive response that I got. I was really impressed with that. And then I wrote another article for the American Scholar not long after that, where I complained about the fact that this was about how scientists react to atheism. And I was saying that every scientist that I talked to wanted me to make the argument in favor of evolution. Evolution that the public needs to know that evolution is real, that the Earth is not just 6,000 years old. And so they would tell me, please try to convince the public about religion. But they said nothing about any of the other aspects of um, what religion was, was doing. You know, like things like the resurrection or the virgin birth or all of these other things that are scientifically close to impossible, and they didn't want to touch that. So I actually came out with an article complaining that scientists were not doing enough to take on the whole big mess of, it's not, okay, if you believe in God, that's one thing, but there are so many elements of how religion is presented to the public that are just scientifically impossible. And so I feel as though scientists should play more of a role in making that point, but there's a, a lot of reluctance to do that. And there still is, and so, I think that's a shame. Like a book with the talking snake, for example, you would think that that would raise some <laughs> eyebrows. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I really felt like there's so much about it. It's difficult, it's very difficult, and I don't know what the answer is, but I do feel that when now, when we're talking about misinformation and all the bad information that's out there, well, I hate to say it, but a lot of the religious tenets are also misinformation. You know, when you're writing about how we're all going to rise from the dead and we'll be together and we'll talk to our loved ones again. Look, I would love to be able to do that with my dead father, but I know it's just not going to happen. And if I were to say or imply that it's possible, to me, that would be a form of misinformation. And I think it's just as irresponsible as talking about, you know, vaccines don't work or anything else that is part of the, the national dialogue. We, now. we actually have a bumper sticker at the Freedom from Religion Foundation that says, religion, the original alternative facts. <laughs> That's right. I know. So I feel like there should be more of that spoken about, but it's very difficult because you don't want to tell people that they're Hmm. that they're being foolish, but there is a lot of it that is kind of ridiculous to me. And so, and anti-scientific, and anti-rational thought, and anti-evidence. What is the evidence for the resurrection? I'll tell you what it is, zero. Huh. So then it's just a question of, well, if we're going to say that we should believe scientific evidence, this is a big area where we're not willing to touch it. And I think that's still a problem. And I get angry at scientists who are not willing to touch it. 
So I, I think it's encouraging, Natalie, that back in 2001, you say you didn't have that much of a backlash. In 2001, about 14% of the country said that they were non-religious. Today, it's about double in the last 20 years. It's about double. Do you think the backlash is the same or better, or do you think it's, it's getting worse today? You know, I, I can't quite figure out what's going on because on the one hand, you know, I was just looking at some statistics from the Pew Research Center survey. They said that 29% of Americans, now about three in 10, describe themselves as religiously unaffiliated or nuns. And that's 6% higher than it was five years ago, 10% higher than it was a decade ago. Um, fewer than half of all Americans say they pray every day, and that's a big drop from 2007 when 60% of them said that, although whether it's true or not, nobody ever knows. It does seem like it's going in the right direction. At the same time, it, it does seem as though there's still a lot of religiosity. I know that uh, my daughter encounters, you know, scientists who, who are very religious, and she's always mystified by that because she is actually a more militant atheist than I am. Really? Well, good for her. <laughs> 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 but but there are things that you wrote about that haven't changed um, from 2001, where you said religion gets a special dispensation. So our numbers have grown, but I, I think there still is that, that big backlash, you know, with religious privileging and corporations like Hobby Lobby saying they have a religious right to deny women contraception that they want, that kind of thing. Right. It's a political problem, I guess. It is, yes. It is a political problem. And... Um... Well, I don't know. It seems like the partisan break in this country is definitely getting bigger and bigger. And, uh, you know, some of these anti-abortion bills that are passing in various states are very scary. And I was just reading about the, you know, that Oklahoma bill. That's gonna make, yeah, to make performing an abortion a felony, uh, you know, punishable with up to 10 years in prison. It's unbelievable to me that people would do that. And then some of these red states are, are beginning to argue that if you are a resident of our state, you should not be able to go to a blue state to get an abortion. And, you know, can you imagine what are you going to do? You're going to send people after them, sort of like the slave catchers from the right. 19th century? Yeah, runaway women. Hmm. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. But this is what's happening. And um, so at the same time that we're seeing these very encouraging statistics of people not being that serious about religion or not praying every day, you're seeing this incredible religious backlash. And one of the things that I have been concerned about, and I don't know if it's true or not, you know, if you talk about Darwinian success, um, the right wing is actually, I think, better at at outbreeding the, the progressives. You know, if you look at the numbers of children they have, uh, and in fact, a lot of these anti-abortion bills, you can see them almost as a back way, sort of Darwinian hedge. So you're gonna get more people who are gonna have kids, more, more people voting for these very restrictive laws. So, I, you know, this is a problem people have not confronted, that what do we do about the fact that the right wing actually does, if you look at the st statistics, they have more children per family than people on the, on the left. So it doesn't take very long for those statistics to show up in the votes. Okay, but, and, but uh, Natalie, you wrote about this actually in your 2001 article. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that talk about breeding makes an assumption that religion is something that is genetic or inherited. Uh, and you point out that even among scientists, there's a debate about whether religion is something innate. I mean, it could be that a lot of these children of conservatives are going to rebel against their parents' upbringing. What do, you, what do you think today about that question of whether religion is innate? You know, one of the things that has been shown is that people's uh, political affiliations are actually tend to be fairly closely tied to their families. And so some of them may rebel, certainly you know, my my daughter's boyfriend, his parents are big Tucker Carlson fans, and so, and he's not, but that happens, but I think that's actually the minority of the time. So, 
I don't think it's genetic how how you are politically. I but I do think that how you are raised actually has a huge influence and sometimes a very uh, subliminal one. So that's something that concerns me. Well, uh, for example, I, th I think people, you know, their religious beliefs. If you if you get them young, they are much harder to get rid of. Whereas, well, that's what the Catholic Church always used to say. So I do want to um, quote the ending of your article because it's so sublime. You wrote. I may not believe in life after death, but what a gift it is to be alive now. So when we come back, we want to talk ab about that a little bit, about transcendent nature, and also some of these social issues and the separation of church and state. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hinahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experience as being an atheist through my life, I've found that um, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on uh, my interactions with other people, and that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, science writer, author, and atheist, Natalie Anger is our guest today. So we would love to ask you some questions about these hot topics of the day relating to science and religion and separation of church and state. And um, Dan likes it has a little quip, science has given us a real shot in the arm. Oh, with the vaccine? With, with the vaccine. <laughs> but look at all these anti-vaxxers. And so I wonder what your thoughts have been over the past two years to see the anti-science backlash. Well, I think that the whole anti-vax thing comes strictly from the fact that it was just Donald Trump feeling like the uh, pandemic was interfering with his ability to get reelected. And so he was downplaying it, downplaying it. And even though he was the one that started this, uh, you know, this super fast attempt to get a vaccine. He turned against the whole idea of the pandemic, and so everybody else had to turn against it, so they became anti-vaxxers. It's interesting because the anti-vaxxers, the previous ones were the ones who were more from the left, another crazy reaction. So, but I think it's more political than it is rejecting the science. I think they've used that as an excuse, but I think that the actual truth is that Donald Trump turned against it and everybody had to listen to Donald Trump. And so, oh, we can't get the vaccine. That's what liberals do. And it's just a lot of garbage. Um, but it's really tragic because it was an amazing accomplishment to come up with yes. a vaccine so quickly. And I remember, you know, the movie Contagion, where they came up with a vaccine eventually, and there was never a question in that movie. Everybody was going to get the vaccine. This was like, oh, here's the answer to this, our prayers, if you will, that we can now all stay alive. So 
it was just a crazy thing that just happened with the timing of it and with the election and with Donald Trump being such a nutcase. Um, so I'm not sure it's about the science per se, but then it had to get built into that. It had to evolve into that. People had to come up with excuses for it. So mm. I don't know. It's been the weirdest thing to me. Well, On some people... Other hand, some people are anti-science. I mean, there are some who, who, are, who are skeptical about science. Look at, at um, Madison Cawthorn, uh, the U.S. representative who was making this ridiculous statement, um, complaining that our new uh, Supreme Court Justice um, Brown Jackson couldn't explain what a woman is when that <laughs> testimony came up. And you've written this fascinating book, Woman in Intimate Geography, that, that explored a lot of biology and you must have some opinions about Madison Cawthorn, the, the whole line of questioning, and also this whole anti-trans um, legislation that is being passed targeting uh, trans girls in, in middle schools and high schools. Uh, I'd just like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, the whole trans, the whole question of trans movement and, and how to define a woman, a trans woman as a woman, um, this is a kind of... This is a difficult issue because, on the one hand, it is true that a trans woman is a woman. On the other hand, you know, questions like pregnancy, abortion, menstruation, all of this are part of the intimate experience of, of being biologically a woman. So the question is, is there a biological legitimacy to being a woman or a man? And I actually think there is, and that's why I wrote Woman. But it seems as though that then becomes part of the war of over how we define people, their gender. Um, and I don't think it's so simple. I really think that being a woman, I've always thought that being a woman has a biological core to it, but that how you build around that and what you make of it is not determined by biology. You know, that there's no, I don't really think that a lot of our behaviors had this strong kind of biological root. I think that being a human and being extremely behaviorally flexible is our ultimate strength. So I've never liked the whole evolutionary psychology argument where, you know, men are like this, women are like that. So on the one hand, I, I actually believe in this kind of gender fluidity. On the other hand, there is a biological component to the reality of having two X chromosomes and what that means on a molecular level, having eggs rather than sperm, um, you know, being the one who bears children, all of these biological realities of being a woman are worth considering. I don't think we should throw that all out just because we're trying to make the case that, you know, people can do what they want and feel like they are who they are, but that doesn't mean that my biological interpretation of being a woman is wrong. So it's a very, it's a very touchy subject, though. I can't tell you how touchy it is. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who are trans in our society, in our culture, and we should deal with them, I would think, with compassion and acceptance, unlike what a lot of these uh, conservatives are saying. Right, I agree. Um, but the other question, I mean, this is something where, for example, if, you know, should you give puberty blockers uh, to children. I don't think it's so cut and dry. I think the evidence is still being formed. I think that yeah. we need more studies, we need more data, but I don't think it's as easy as some people think it is to just say, uh, you know, this person is, is a, wants to be a girl, it has, you know, a, I really feel like we're kind of going too quickly into assuming that everything is fungible. So it's not a cut and dried issue. Yes, trans people should be allowed to be whatever they want to be. On the other hand, do we want to give children, you know, these strong medications? And it's interesting because one of the subjects that I covered, you know, a few years ago was on the whole question of intersex. And, um, people who, who were born with ambiguous genitals. And a lot of them went through these harrowing surgeries to try to make their genitals conform to either what 
the doctor thought it should be male or female. And a lot of them who had enlarged clitorises had them cut back, and then they had never had any sensation. You know, all sorts of interventionists when they were very young. And so they argued strenuously to stop doing that, to stop having medical interventions on children. And now we see in the trans movement, maybe they want to have more interventions with children. So it's a very, it's, it's a complicated issue. There's biology and then there's the whole kind of socio-political uh, question. It's not straightforward at all. Don't you think with, with religion, though, there's a tendency to make this complicated issue a simplistic binary thing. It's either yes or no. And yes. there, a lot of the problem with religion is their unwillingness to see the gray areas. I absolutely agree. And, and religion does not help at all. And so, you know, I think a lot of what's happened with this legislation, like, oh, you know, banning the mentioning of you can't say, don't say gay or don't say trans. It's all just, you know, they're just kind of disguising their religiosity in, in what sounds like cool terminology, but it really ultimately is all about authority and, you know, kind of traditional religion and traditional sources of authority. So that's, that's not a solution either. So but, yeah. in, in about a minute, we only have about a minute left to change the topic. We would love to have you to ask you what you've been reading or what you are recommending when it comes to science and science authors. Um, yes, you know, I just finished a very interesting book called uh, The Dawn of Everything. I don't know if you've yeah, seen it. Yeah, me that. too. I just finished it myself. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating look at, you know, the whole sweep of human prehistory. Yeah. And I highly recommend that to anybody. You know, I think on the there were times when I felt like he was overreaching because he comes from this kind of anarchist background and he wants to see all of history as being... A variation on that, but I think his talking about how we've misinterpreted history because we come to it with all these preconceptions is very refreshing. So yeah. I would highly recommend that book. It's two, it's two authors. It's Graeber and Wengro together. And so. we highly recommend your books too, Natalie, and thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.